Okay. So I do that after all those jokes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, you know what? Hang on, I didn't get all my get all my stuff here. Hang on. Okay. I got some notes. Okay, so we're going to start a study in the Book of Revelation, and we're probably not going to get into the actual book. For this week, next week, next week be some more introductory stuff, and uh, because I think we have a master's men's business meeting next week, so that cuts that, you know, a little bit short. But here's the thing with the Book of Revelation: you have to get comfortable with what's happening. You know, you can't just jump into it. People do. I mean, you know, obviously, you physically can jump in and go, "Oh wow, this reminds me of the '60s, man." <laughs> but but you have to you have to be comfortable with what's happening, what's trying to be communicated, how it's being you know communicated. So you know I have that one the um, questions about prophecy, and, and this isn't a quiz. These are just questions that I know that I've been asked over the you know years when I either teach on prophecy proper or the Book of Revelation. You know. Because all the prophetic stuff, even all the stuff on here, doesn't come from the book of Revelation. The people will think about Revelation when they hear of these things, you know, but they come from other books or somebody makes them up in their, you know, their head. Who here, seriously, I mean, not a right answer, wrong answer, just for information, who here has actually sat down, read the book of Revelation? From beginning to end, and uh, kind of understood it. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So three, four, you know, three, four people. It's see. Here's the thing. It's a book that people. It's easy to avoid. Yeah, you know, because people just think it's too strange. Martin Luther even <laughs> said, you know, Martin Luther didn't write a commentary on um, uh, revolution is. Bill Allen said, on Revelation, you know, he said, maybe someday someone will come along that can explain it to me, you know? But I don't think it's that hard. But I think that the hard part comes is that people don't try to figure out what the setting is and all of, um, and all of that. So, you know, God's not going to write a book to scare us. Because our God doesn't you know, he might write a book for unbelievers to try to scare them, but he's not going to write a book, you know, to us to try to scare them. Who has Revelation open? And we'll read chapter one, verse three. Carl, do your microphone. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Because the time is near. Yeah, it's a blessing to read the book of Revelation. My translation says, for him who reads it out loud, you know, it's a, you know, it's a blessing. But I think if we get three verses into the book and it says it's going to be a blessing, we ought to be able to discard the part that it's scary or that it's talking about our damnation or... <laughs> whatever people might get out of it. And there are a lot of things that are kind of weird and scary, you know, in it, but it's the it's the language that's used. There. And I think that Revelation is the only book in the Bible that attaches a blessing to it if you read it. You know, the other books may be blessings, but it's not ascribed to it in the actual, you know, the actual text itself. Well remember there's a word at the end add to this book and to not detract anything from this book. From that book, right. Yeah. yeah. And there's there's a similar reading in Deuteronomy about adding or subtracting. People misread that and they say, well, you can't add anything to the Bible. You know, but the thing is Deuteronomy, like you bring up, Deuteronomy is what the fourth book of the Bible. So in the Old Testament, you got from five to thirty-nine that were added after Deuteronomy, <laughs> so it can't mean that. It's just talking about whatever said here 
don't add or subtract from it. Problem with Revelation, a lot of people add to it because they add to it when they try to start doing some kind of interpretation, you know, like that. But see, we gotta under we gotta understand the language. We'll, we'll go th get into this more as we go through it. But you know, the imagery that's in there. You know, we talk this way. You know, it, when they talk about the bees and the this and the that, you know, but we look 2,000 years later and we go, well, what does that mean? Why are they talking like that? But imagine if somebody picked up a newspaper, the, what's the name of our paper? The Herald something? The Herald? I don't think it is. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, pick up any, pick up any newspaper and they read about it and they read about, you know, political things about the donkeys and the elephants. They see the symbols. We're pretty much going back to hieroglyphics anymore because people can't read or don't <laughs> read. You know? But what does it mean? So what do they look at? What What's the donkey in politics? No, Democrats. Yeah, who's the elephants? The Republicans. You know? Who, what was the symbol back in the Soviet Union times? I don't know if it is now. But for the Soviet Union back then, the bear. the bear. See, we know that kind of, you know, we know that kind of. So, what's the symbol for the United States? Eagle. Eagle. See, we know all of that stuff. So, if we're reading about it, we picture what it is. We know what it is. But when they're talking about it two thousand years ago, we have to figure out. What, you know, we have to figure out what the heck is he? What the heck is he talking about? You know, in that. So. You know, so we do that. We read a, a sports headline, you know, and the sports headline says that the, you know, the, um, you know, that the, the Cubs club the Cardinals. Does that mean that some bear was beating up on birds? No, it means that the Cubs, you know, beat the Cardinals in baseball. You know, like, but we read that kind of stuff and we don't, we don't give a second thought to the imagery that's in there. And that's what we'll see in the, you know, in the book of, you know, in the book of Revelation, you know, and so, but I've got questions when I was asking how many people have, you know, um, read, read the book of Revelation and kind of understood, but let me ask these questions and just think, are you familiar with the terms? Are you familiar with the concepts? Have you read them somewhere? Have you heard, you know, a lot of stuff we hear from, you know, movies or, uh, we even hear from preaching that's, you know, wrong. But are we in the last days and in the end times? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We are because Peter said we were. <laughs> yeah. so you can't get since, any... since Christ left. Right. Yeah. No. Since since uh, Christ left. Yeah. Since the the ascension. What's the mark of the beast? Six, six, six. No, but what what's it for? I mean, what is, you know, what what is the mark of the beast? To buy and sell. Pardon? To buy and sell. Well, no, that's what you that's what it keeps faith. that's what it keeps you from that's what it keeps you from doing. <laughs> you know, if you if you don't have the mark of the beast on your forehead or your right right hand, you know, you can't buy you can't buy or sell. You know, like that. So, does that mean we're gonna have a? You know, or does that mean that we're gonna have a mark on our head? You know, barcode. A barcode, yeah, Roger. We the microphone. Well, no, that, that's what I was going to say. See, we talk about the mark of the beast. Can a Christian take the mark of the beast? Because the Christian already has, Roger says, the mark of Christ on our forehead, that baptism, okay. on our body. I mean, yeah, you know, like that. We already have the name of, you know, the name of Christ. Like that. What do I got here? Um, Let's see. Well, I got what's the meaning of 666? We'll talk about that when we get down to numbers. Same thing. Who are the 144, you know, thousand, you know, because that's a particular number, you know. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses have taken that to say that that's them, literally, literally yes. that the hey, first 144,000, you know, hey, heaven's open, you know, for the first 144,000 while seats are available, you know. <laughs> Okay. No, 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 no. But the thing is, that, see, they have no problem that the that the that the saved, they're saved, live on earth. We we do that too, you know. We, we, 
we'll live on the new earth, the new heavens and the new earth. You know, I don't know whether we go back and forth or not. <laughs> Who's the Antichrist? Anybody that's against Christ. Yeah. Yeah, but see, yeah. but what? But what do most people think? The devil. No, they're thinking a person or a a single, a single being. But you know, Antichrist the word is only used in the book of First John. And when he uses it there, he's talking about people who teach against Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the only place where the Antichrist, you know, is. Pardon? Christ plus. Christ plus. Christ. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be as simple as that. People that are well-meaning who say that you're saved by Christ instead of Christ alone, Christ plus this. Do enough good works, you know, do a do a whatever that adds to it. It means that you're antichrist, at least that mean you are the antichrist, but you are antichrist in that teaching. I think the proper wording to that should be who are the antichrist. Who are the antichrist? Yeah, exactly. Not who is, but who are. Yeah. Now there is in one of those Thessalonian books that Paul wrote, it talks about the man of sin. So then they take the description of the man of sin and say, okay, that's the Antichrist, but it never calls him the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. so. Who here knows who the two witnesses are in the book of Revelation? You know, you find out when we get to chapter, chapter 11, because see, this is the thing, and this goes to the way that people teach the book of Revelation. Um, uh, you're, uh, you know, you're throughout, I'll probably just call them the rapture theology people, okay? Those who believe that, you know, that there'll be a rapture seven years before the return of Christ. Um, and, uh, you know, what happens in that interim, and then Christ comes back to the church somewhere in there, they'll <laughs> believe that the two witnesses are actual people, you know, that they're actual people that come down, preach get killed, you know, get martyred, um, and then are assumed, uh, assumed up into, you know, heaven. I mean, at this point, I'm not going to say yay or nay, or, you know, I'm going to say nay. <laughs> Will there be a third Jewish temple built? Yeah. We don't need answers. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, those are the questions that come up. What's the abomination of desolation? These are all things that we'll deal with. That, I don't think, is in Revelation. That's in Daniel. Matthew or something. Daniel. 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 Yeah. Well, but uh, Jesus quotes it also. Oh, yeah. So, when will the rapture happen? No. That, that'd be a good one. Pardon? <laughs> well, the, 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 there again, you know, is, you know, is there one? You know, what do they call? They call the rapture. We, I'll now give it away here. We would say the resurrection. You know, if they see a rapture and then a resurrection. You know, Dr. John's got to point it out. Dr. John's got a good book. Um, here, let me hold it up for you. Which shows, it's still available. Yeah, it's still available. It's called More Than Conquerors. And it is... It's this commentary on Revelation, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. No, no, I, I just didn't remember if it was on the commentary like on last time or something. Yeah. He comes from the right point of view. I mean, I don't want to skew people's you know, opinions, but he comes from the right, um, you know, right point of view, even though he's not, <laughs> even though he's not a Lutheran, but I guess, I guess we'll let him in. Let me tell you something, is that um, you almost always have to go outside Lutheran circles to find a good book on end times. And, and it's not because Lutherans write bad books, which they're capable of, but it's not they don't write bad books. They don't write very many books on the end times. You know, it's almost like a, you know, it'll all pan out in the end. And, you know, so you end up by having to go to, um, you know, going to outside sources, which isn't bad. I mean, that's not, you know, 
Anyway, as we go as we go through, let me let me just run through these just so you've got them in your ears. Um, you know, what's the Battle of Armageddon? How big how big is the Battle of Armageddon? That Armageddon's a big deal. Is it? No, really. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? They go against God and got that and they're gone. Yeah. You know, it's like you know, we hear, we hear we hear all this stuff, or at least I have, because I kind of grew up with this and in my first 25 years as a, you know, as a Christian, you know, the Battle of Armageddon is just going to be the war of the world against Israel and God, you know, and that the blood's going to be up to the bridles of the, um, you know, the horses and, you know, this and that. And it's like, no, if you read it, the description says they come up against God. And God says no and wipes them out. Like not even a shot fired. You know? <laughs> but again, culturally, we've got all of these stories that are um, that are told. And again, the stories may get expanded while people are trying to actually teach about them. I'm not saying everybody's got bad motives and things like that. It's just that, hey, we got this battle of Armageddon. What's it going to be like? Let's picture the worst thing that you could ever, you know, that you can ever, um, that you can ever picture. So let's see. Um, Who's Gog and Magog? That, now that's a big biblical, those are big biblical things because they're back in Ezekiel and um, here in Revelation. Yeah, just we'll, we'll figure figure that out. Uh, the day of the Lord. Who or what is mystery Babylon? I'm just going to go through and read these. Who's the man of lawlessness? We already talked about that, and that that's in. Um, one of those Thessalonians that Paul wrote where people ascribe the Antichrist to, you know, to him. Um, will we see the great tribulation? When will the resurrection occur? Well, what's the meaning of time, times, and a half a time? There's a good one. Okay. Um, what is Jesus's millennial reign? What are Daniel's 70 weeks? Because a lot of what people read into the book of Revelation, they say, is what is happening in that gap between the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel. You know? So, um, are blood moons, eclipses, signs of the last days? You know, the blood moons have been big the last several, you know, the big several, you know, last several years. Like, hey, you're going to have a blood moon, you know? And then, let me tell you the 10 points that, Ten biblical points that are happening because we're having the blood moon. You know, so. When will Satan be bound? That's a good one. What is meant by the phrase wars and rumors of wars? Who are the beast and the false prophet? When's the second coming? And lastly, how do I understand the book of Revelation? I guarantee you, if you put in a little bit of work and follow up on these things, you know, you will come out on the other end understanding the book of Revelation. Um, Roger. Uh, question nine, question 24, the same thing. Um, let's see, nine. Well, to us, they are. Okay. To not most, to the Baptist. Pardon? Not, not to, to the Baptist. Not to the Baptist. All right. Yeah, they're two separate things because they say that the rapture happens seven years before the second coming okay now now we kind of believe in a rapture of sorts in that we will probably go up to meet the lord at his return and return with him and we see that in the book of matthew with the ten virgins okay and the story of the ten virgins because you know the story of the ten virgins is that Five were wise, five were foolish, but really the only difference between the two of them, because even the wise ones fell asleep, okay, while they were waiting. The only difference was is that the foolish ones didn't carry extra oil. People want to say, well, they brought their lamps, but they didn't bring oil. They brought oil. They didn't have extra oil. So when the oil ran out, the wise ones had oil to build, because they said, hey, give us some of your extra oil. And when they went to uh, Maverick, to go buy some oil, the Lord returned. Okay, but what it says is that the people went heard that the Lord was returning and went out the roadway 
to meet and greet and return with him. So if there's a rapture, that's our view of the rapture that we may go through, you know, like that. So, but even that may be, you know, may be symbolic. So let's see. Um, what are we getting? What time is it? Ah. You know, let me try to give a let me give a synopsis of the book of Revelation, or at least the. I'm not going to go through all the different things that happen, but at least the tone of the book, okay? Yeah. Number one, Jesus died and rose again. You know, I think I'd have somewhere in the introduction, I don't know if it's this week or, you know, uh, or next week. You know, the difference between what the gospel writers wrote and what John wrote in Revelation <laughs> is that the gospel writers wrote what Jesus did while he was on earth. Okay? We got that? I mean, you know, from his birth to, you know, his death and resurrection. In fact, his ascension comes in the book of Acts, so it doesn't even come in the gospel. Revelation is written what Jesus did or is doing after his ascension. Okay, while he's in heaven, because it'll open up with him, you know, with him in heaven. Like that. So that's what, you know, that's um, what, so again, Jesus died and rose again. You know, after that, he ascended into heaven. He's in heaven now. Now, he's in heaven now. Where are we? I couldn't hear. On earth, right? He's, he's in heaven. We're on earth. Okay, so who who's the Lord of all? Come on, this is a good Sunday school answer. Mm -hmm. Jesus, okay. <laughs> okay, so down here on earth, does it look like Jesus is in control? Uh, all you gotta do is look at the shootings last week in California. You know, I'm not saying whether he's in control, I'm saying does it look like he's in control? No way. Not that. Um, so the church is watching the world fall apart, and it is falling apart. Agreed? No, it's been falling apart. It's probably been falling apart since the garden. Okay, now there's an end to this. Okay, all of those who are on Team Jesus win and live with him in paradise. Sound good? Okay, so we want to be on Team Jesus. Um, everyone not on Team Jesus will die, and then we'll face another death, which will be worse than the first death. And that is called the second death. <laughs> okay, so which team do you want to be on? You want to be on Team Jesus. Okay. Even if you're on Team Jesus, between now and the time he returns, you'll go through the same garbage that everyone else goes through. And that's the thing that's hard for Christians to buy sometimes. If Jesus is in control, if I'm a follower of Jesus, why do I go through so much turmoil, tragedy? Yeah, fill in the blank, whatever. Pardon? Yeah, no, no, well, yeah. <laughs> but but he told us. Well, what you got to do is you got to read the Bible to know that he told us. You know, and a lot of people don't. I mean, a lot of Christians don't. Or they do, but then they lose track of it because it's easy to get caught up in the problem. I mean, anybody here ever get caught up in an issue and you just forget about even forget Jesus for a minute. You even lose your good senses of what to do. You know, we do that. What are you going to say, Joe? I'm just going to say that it's apparent that many Christian denominations teach that if you're a Christian, you're handed a rose garden. Why yeah. we do that? Well, that's a false teaching. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and the reason that you don't get the goodies or you don't get the good life or you don't have a smooth, easy life is because you're a Christian. 
Wow. <laughs> well, you don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, if you had enough faith, you know, but because you don't have the faith, you know, you're not getting what God has promised you. If you have, pardon? It's your work. It must work. That's that's right. Wait, Denny had something. Yeah, I was just thinking when I was talking about that right there, the book of Job and what happened to Job. You know, Job was really blessed. But then the devil said to to him, that, well, that's because he's been so blessed that he's so faithful. Let me take care. Let me yeah. take it all away from him and see how faithful he is. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the stuff is just there because we live in a fallen world. You know, even though we are good and we are covered in the clothing of Jesus, you know, put on, you know, put on Christ and all of that stuff, we still have to be in this world. And you can't get away from this world. And we're influenced by it. Wait, before Joe, somebody else, did you? No? Okay, Joe. Yeah, you were talking about the ten virgins earlier, and I always look at the virgins who have the extra oil. It's not up to bring the extra oil. The extra oil is endurance. <clears throat> Can you endure what you're going to face? Can you wait the duration of the time? Mm -hmm. And the question is, is your faith strong enough to endure time? Mm -hmm. Well, you know. <laughs> I think the part about the extra oil, I'm not discounting what you're saying, but I think the part about the extra oil is we know he's coming. We have to have the oil. We don't know when he's coming. We better bring some extra. Yeah, we better bring some extra. Yeah. Well, right, right, right. No, no, I said I'm not discounting what you're saying. I'm just trying to clarify, you know, that they had... Um, See, it's not like the others didn't have faith. I mean, they had faith. They just kind of presumed on God, you're coming right now. You know, like that. So, anyway. Okay. So, let's see. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we get all the garbage because the world's falling apart. And the world's falling apart because God is opposed to sin. Okay. Now, this may sound strange, okay? But the world's falling apart because God's opposed to sin, and people are opposed to God. You know, therefore, see, if they followed God, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't break His laws. You know, so but God's opposed to sin. People naturally opposed to God, and therefore they, you know, therefore they sin. So the world isn't this Eve, Adam and Eve. God, God said, God said, look, you know, you guys got the good life there. One rule. How much can it hurt to follow one rule? <laughs> that woman you gave me. <laughs> yeah, no. So, you know, so before, you know, before we think that, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's because, um, you know, because Putin causes all this trouble and we got all this turmoil in the no, it's as simple as breaking one of God's, you know, breaking one of God's rules. Um, Ray. Well, the thing is that because we don't want to follow God's rule, then we just do away with God and we make up our own God. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're creating God in our image. Right. What is it? God God created man in his image, and ever since then we've been returning the favor. <laughs> so okay, so God's opposed to sin, but we're in favor of sin. Um, so as we live our life, we can live on team sin or team Jesus. Okay. Again, which one do you want to be on? Okay, but here's the good news. And Jesus has put you on his team in baptism. We're all, anybody who's been baptized is on team Jesus. You know, we may be disobediently on team Jesus and we cause trouble in our own, you know, we cause trouble in our own life. 
But here's the thing. Is when we get to the book of Revelation and we're talking about the scenes are going to change from earth to heaven. From earth to heaven. So you're going through all these battles and wars and all this nasty stuff that's happening. Okay? But then it shifts and it says, but meanwhile, in heaven. And then you see the glory of God up in heaven and the worship that goes on there. And in certain places, you see uh, those who are martyred for their faith up there worshiping the lamb. Okay. <clears throat> and then it comes back to earth. You know, all this crap is happening on earth. You know? But then we got to remember, we're on Team Jesus. And that's what's happening up in heaven. And the scene keeps changing back and forth, back and forth. Bruce? I just go back to number 24. When is the second coming? <clears throat> Isn't it always, every day, when the Lord comes for us, also? Wait, say, say, say it again. Do it in your microphone, but say it again. When is the second coming? Uh -huh. Second. Isn't it almost every day or ongoing, as he calls us to take him, take us to him? Also, I mean, it, it's like, our expectation it, should be every day, but the second coming is an actual in-time not end time, an end time event that happens. But our expectation should be should be always, you know. And there's nothing standing in the way for it to become today, right now. We're walking out to our cars, and poof! In fact, we're in the, you know, we're in the kingdom. Yeah. So. So let's see, uh, let's see. So Jesus, uh, let's see, put you on his team uh, in baptism. He's forgiven all your sins through his death and resurrection. So even when you see all this garbage happening, even the sin in our own lives, don't lose hope. And that's what people do. You know, people see the garbage in their own life and they lose hope because they forget who, who they are. <clears throat> This is the reason that Revelation is written. Like I say, it's not written to scare people to death. There may be scary language, scary images, and things like that. But it's for the Christian. God did not give us prophecy to scare us. He gave us prophecy to prepare us and to pre prepare our hearts. Um, you know, and because you're on Team Jesus, you know, he wins. Uh, yeah, and since we're coming up to Super Bowl pretty soon, you know what it's saying. Here's what the book of Revelation is saying. Even if you throw more interceptions than completions in the first half of the game, don't give up. Keep going. Because Team Jesus wins the Super Bowl. And that and that's that's the that's the book of Revelation. Now the details we'll get into when we get there. We'll talk about the details of what's happening. We'll talk about the imagery um, because there's a lot of imagery, but the imagery all means something, you know. Um, why the imagery is there uh, that way? I think those people understood it. You know, you read where people say, "Well, John wrote kind of in a clandestine language, so that the Romans, you know, if they got a hold of it, they wouldn't know." Because this is really a uh, a treatise against Rome and the power that Rome had over the <laughs> over the church at the time, you know. But I don't know that that's it. I think Romans could have been smart enough to try to figure it out, you know, like that. So, so what do you think so far? <clears throat> yeah, I'm kind. Okay. Uh, let's see. So on the on the other sheet, we'll just get to a point or two on there. On the other, sheet. any questions about um, what we talked about? I know that um, you know the thing about the, the way I went over it. You know, wasn't an overview of the events necessarily happening in you know in Revelation because that's what people give. They say, yeah, you know, you look at the you know the first chapter is Jesus appearing and talking to the churches and giving them the lampstands and. This and then it moves on to this, and then he writes the letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three, and then in four and five we see the you know John being called up to heaven and you know seeing the glory. 
I didn't want to give that kind of an overview. We'll give that, we'll probably talk about that next week. But I want people to get comfortable. So why the book is there and why it should be read. So, so like it said in verse three, it's going to be a blessing to the church and to the people in the church. We got to see what that blessing is. And the blessing is, is to save us from the garbage that is happening now. Were you going to say something, Denny? Did I miss anybody online? Did anybody have their hand up? Or Okay, Denny. Yeah, uh, my uh, study Bible gives an overview. It's called The Masculine Perspective. Don't mess with God. Talk about high action. This book is as vivid and violent as a science fiction thriller. That's because it represents the battle of the ages, God versus evil. His conquest is worth our greatest applause. Yeah, I mean, you know, people come up with all different kinds of, you know, little sayings about, you know, what that purpose would look hang on just a second John. Let, let me just say something about study bibles you know i th this is for your benefit i don't take any of my lesson or notes or anything out of study bibles okay i do it on purpose i mean it's not i don't trust study bibles and stuff like that i want to leave that up to you guys so if you guys see a note in your study bible that you think needs to be brought up Bring it up because I mean it's maybe something I'll cover, you know, because I have common thoughts like they have common thoughts and stuff like that. But it's not like um, I, I leave that up to you guys. You guys have study Bibles and you see a particular note that you like in there. Bring it up, um, you know. Okay, John. <clears throat> in this book, the More Than Conquerors, the author says, in the main, the purpose of the Book of Revelation is to comfort the militant church in a struggle against the forces of evil. Read it again. Do it a little louder. Maybe <clears throat> face them. Huh? Oh. Okay, well, let's go to me where it is in the book. Where the highlight? Highlight. Huh? I got this. Okay, it says, in the main, the purpose of the book of Revelation is to comfort the militant church in its struggle against the forces of evil. Do you understand the difference of the militant church? You know, the militant church is the church here on earth. And I forgot the one in heaven. Who's there? Um, why can't I remember? Yeah, the, the church militant here. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Church triumphant is the church that's in heaven. They've already fought their battle. They've won their battle. They're in heaven. Right now, we are the church militant here. We're fighting. It doesn't mean militant like we're the military. Okay. But it's, we have a fight in front of us. So he says, the main purpose of the book of Revelation is to comfort the militant church in its struggle against the forces of evil. He governs the world in the interest of his church. I guess I should have just read that. Save me those 25 points that I brought up. <laughs> Some people have a way of, you know, minimizing, you know, words they use the as you mentioned about using study Bibles, I, I highly recommend that, but you have to kind of watch out for your source because your notes may differ. If it's not a Lutheran study Bible, yeah. it may be a lot different than what we're going to be hearing here. Right, right. But if you bring it up, and I think it's off base, I mean, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you know. But you know, I'll tell you something that I had a, a problem with yesterday. You talk about study Bibles, you know, how you get used to them. I'm working on, we're starting a study in book of um, Genesis on Sunday. Okay, and I forget what it was that I was looking for. Oh, I wonder, no, I, there's something simple. I wonder how many pages were in the book of Genesis. But you can't use a study Bible because they've got half the pages of their notes and all that. I looked around. I could not find where I had a Bible with no notes. I I ended up by getting my Jewish Bible out, you know, and I was able to. Do, so it's around seventy pages in a book that's like like that, like that. But in case you want to know, but yeah, it let, lets you know how comfortable you get with study Bible. And I have from all different perspectives uh, instead of just sitting down and reading. You know, instead of reading the Bible, but I couldn't find one on my shelf other than that, and I probably have twenty on my shelf. You know, 
just I was, I was halfway embarrassed. I was working on it yesterday. I do not have a Bible. Well, I have one that's a it's got four translations, but that wouldn't serve my purpose because you know what are you gonna say, Ray, and then we'll close up. Well, the thing was then reading Revelation, and I've read it several different mm -hmm. times. That that was the way I spent my time on the bus going to and from work with reading Revelation. The thing that I got was the fact that these people were literally by saying they were Christian were signing a death warrant. Yeah. That they were heavily uh, persecuted yeah. by the leaders, the 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 emperors or the kings at yeah. the time. Caesar, I mean, he and Nero in particular would take pleasure in putting somebody on a stake and torturing them. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I mean, and, uh, yeah. And 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 the other thing is, is that these people will find out because so much of the Book of Revelation comes out of the Book of Ezekiel and the Book of Daniel. Um, you know, and that and Zachariah, thank you. You know, is that those people had to know that, and it survived. Well, yeah, well, because they had God's protection, and you know, Rome. You know, Rome is funny. I'll finish up with this. Rome was funny. You know, Rome let people alone to have their own religion. They didn't care. They they really didn't. That's why the Jews got along. Okay, until, you know, Rome later on started having some issues. All they cared about, I don't, I don't care that you're a Jew, you're a Hindu, and you're a Buddhist. I don't care about that. But once a year, I want you to be able to come to the temple, the presidio, the what, I don't know what it was, and declare that Caesar is God, and throw in your pinch of incense as an offering to do that. That's all I care. How hard can that be? How hard can it be to live in peace? You know, just declare that Caesar is God. You know, well, for a Christian, it's impossible. Yeah. And then that's what sets the Romans off because the Christians won't. So all these other people will, but the Christians won't. Yeah. That was the whole thing. That they wanted Caesar wanted to say Caesar is Lord, right. and the Christian said, "No, Christ is Lord, right. and I will not bend my knee." Yeah, you know, like that. And so the thing is, do we have that kind of? Do we have that kind of courage? And then if we had that kind of courage, and we were put, or we had to go underground, I don't mean killed and buried underground, <laughs> too, but if we had to go underground, where would we find our comfort? In the scriptures, yeah. yeah. Well, it's like Peter says, "Who do we follow? The rules of men or the rules of God?" Yeah. So, and I'm compelled to follow God. Okay. Any final questions? Then we will get off with our uh, our songs and our prayer and our benediction. And okay. Who who got a question? Oh, Bob, I'm sorry. Well, what are you doing right in front of me, raising your hand? <laughs> I didn't have a question. So much as, uh, Do your microphone. Regarding what you said about Rome. Do the microphone. Uh, regarding what you were saying about Rome, I think our civil government today, likewise, doesn't mind what we believe so long as we don't act on it. And should we act on what we believe, that's when the sparks fly. I think so. I think you're right. You know, I, I, I think you're right. That's why that's why they will say we don't care what you believe, we don't care what you do, but keep it in your church. But when you come out in the public society, we don't want to hear anything. We don't want to hear anything about it. So okay. Anything left on um no.